Take the Nation presenting Succession Recaps. I am your host, Nagin Farsad, and we are dissecting HBO's hit series Succession because we are your pain sponge. And so today, we will tackle the series finale of Succession titled With Open Eyes. Don't be confused, this is still the FTN feed, and you will get your regular episode of Fake the Nation on Thursdays. And perhaps we'll be doing more recap pods into the future, but today, we will be doing this final Succession Recap pod. Today's panel is fit for a king. Our resident wealth expert and artist, Danielle Dershlaw, could not join today, but in her stead is the excellent veteran of Fake the Nation. He's one of the more hilarious comedians you can see on stages across America. He is a writer. He is a producer of television. Um, he is all around menchy human being. He also happens to be a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces, but he's not speaking for them. Uh, he is the one and only, my good friend, Benari Lee Poulton. Thank you, and what an honor and a privilege. Um, I think we have the votes. We have the votes. Let's just skip right to the votes right now. Also joining me today, a guy he can't, that cannot get enough of this recap pod. He is host of the legendary NPR show, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He knows the most things about the most varied subjects of anyone I have ever known. And he is one of the most excellent people in entertainment. On, on top of it all, the guy runs marathons. I mean, can it be more incredible than Peter Sagal? Hey, I just want to say to you both, uh, I love you, but I cannot stomach you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all bullshit. We're all bullshit. <laughs> it, we're all just bullshit. It's just bullshit. Well, listen, I mean, you're disgusting. <laughs> It makes no logical sense. <laughs> so is this going to be a recap or a reenactment? It's, no, it's, it's, just a, it's just a full 90 minutes. Of just us reading yeah. quotes. Um, the, before I, I'm, I'm going to do one of my classic summaries. The summaries the internet has just been dying for. Uh, but before we do that, um, I don't know. Like, how are we feeling just first blush reactions. I just want to say to everyone on Team Kendall, I'm here for you. I embrace you. I was always one of you. Um, how do you guys feel? I, I defer to Benari. Go ahead. I I mean, I, I don't think it could have ended any other way. The 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 children look, I think overall, and I, I stand by this, I've said it before. I feel like the overarching point of this show is that none of it actually matters. They're they're rearranging, you know, the deck chairs on the Titanic of late stage capitalism. This is a condemnation of the system. This is a condemnation of this myth of the competitive marketplace. And I think that one thing that we saw was like the kids fail because they were set up for failure. They were always put in competition with each other as if that were the ideal for success. And all the, the best case scenario that they could inherit was an empire of dirt. Cat, you know, cat food Ozymandias is what's waiting for them. Best case scenario. <laughs> and so, you know, I yeah. think part of this is just, um, you know, the, we see a lot of uh, people doing horrible things in the name of attaining power. And there were a lot of godfather, uh, uh, like iconography and references, I feel like throughout, especially the season of succession. But at the end, Michael Corleone, we're kind of on his side of like, he he sacrificed his family and everything that he valued, but he's in, he's in charge. And what we saw here is what if you do all those terrible things and you're still left with nothing? At the end, you're just a sad billionaire loser wandering the streets with your dad's bodyguard looking after you to make sure you don't jump into the Hudson. Like, oh, Peter, uh, where are you at? Well, I thought it was more upbeat than that. <laughs> no, I, I, no I, I, you know, uh, I used to be, as I occasionally mention when we're doing this kind of thing, a, a dramatist. I used to write plays and screenplays, and 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 I think a lot about structure and, and, and dramaturgy and endings. And if there's one rule of good endings, it's that in retrospect, they should seem inevitable from the moment, right? You don't want an ending they're like, well, where did that come from, you know? And this absolutely hit that. And, and the reason I think it seemed inevitable, uh, I'm actually gonna quote somebody else because he put it so well. This is Carlos Lozada, who's a critic, he used to be for the Washington Post and the New York Times. And he wrote, and he did this, uh, let me see, 28th, he did it yesterday before it broadcast. Um, none of the kids will win. The succession fight was never about who got to run Waystar. It was about who would be chosen by daddy to run Waystar. 
the moment Logan died, they all lost. And that's, I think that's right. I think they didn't know that, but in all the jockeying since episode three of this season, but it was already over because yeah. none of them wanted really to run this company. They all wanted the blessing of their daddy uh, for the reasons that we've talked about. And everybody's talked about the abuse and the withholding and the promising and the gaslighting. And it, it makes absolute sense that it ended up going to somebody who by virtue of not having been raised in this ridiculously abusive family was the only person who could see his way clearly to getting it. And the way to clearly getting it was utterly abasing himself, which is something that the three kids never were willing to do. Uh, well, let's yeah. talk, let's get into the summary real quick. The um, finale episode starts with Ken trying to get the votes for the board meeting. And on the other side of Manhattan, Shiv is working out how many votes she and Madsen have for the board meeting. This gives this episode a very season one feel, lots of jockeying, lots of phones, lots of utterances of the word board. But of course, there's one vote that hasn't been accounted for, and that's Roman, because he's in some kind of jerk dungeon where he's being pity spanked, which turns out to be in the Caribbean with his mom. So the Sids descend on some tropical island where their mother has arranged a light nosh as well as a business pitch from Peter Munyon's minion about what sounded like a timeshare Ponzi scheme for old people. There, they learn that Matson has no interest in naming Shiv as CEO, at which point the Sibs realize they have to create, create a united front behind Kendall. Then, in a kitchen in the Caribbean, they end up having what amounts to be the most shocking scene of the entire series, the only opportunity the actors had to use their smiling face muscles Together, the Sibs have what might popularly be described as fun. They return to New York with enough votes to shatter the Gojo deal. Sh Shiv finds out that Tom would be taking the CEO position, which flambes her butt into really fucking him. But when they're all seated around the conference room table, that fucking conference room table, it's Shiv who can't quite vote Kendall's way. The Sibs have a pull aside that includes physical violence. Shiv walks away and votes against her brother, our number one boy lost. But Tom, Tom Wamscans was named CEO. The deal goes through, the contracts are signed, and Tom wears the crown. Um, Peter, you mentioned that this ending sort of made sense to you dramaturgically, a word that I'm sure we'll hear more today sure. from you and Jeremy yeah. Strong. Um, but... Um, I guess let's just go through this ending for each of the of the characters. Um, I thought one of the most, I, I more I guess baffling endings was the was Shiv. I mean, why did Shiv make this final choice? It really rested on her shoulders, and she oh, shattered it. There will be graduate school uh, theses written on <laughs> Shiv for generations <laughs> because you're right. I mean, I, Shiv's motivations, as you can imagine. They have been already the subject of so much speculation. Uh, and and it's, it's really weird. There are so many things to think about when you're trying to zero in on that question. For Among other things, during the boardroom meeting, just as you said, it comes around to Shiv. She's the deciding vote, right? And she doesn't just say, yes, and look at Kendall. She gets up and she leaves the room. She doesn't know at that moment exactly what she's going to do. She's at war with herself, right? So whatever she decided, whatever her motivations, they weren't crystal clear to her. It wasn't a plot. It was something that happened to her in the moment. She had to leave the room and be by herself. And then it, let me if she hadn't been chased by Kendall and then Roman, if they had, if Kendall hadn't come on the way that he came on, oh, she may have they, voted correctly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I mean, would she? Is it possible that if they had just let her sit with it and decide what to do, she could have come back and voted against? The but deal I think it was it? also important for Kendall to screw up the deal because Kendall can't close a deal. Like, right. That's Kendall he can't close uh, the deal. <laughs> the, the, perhaps in, in a series, a, a television series in which people just say terribly true things to each other all the time. Maybe the most terrible and ultimately truest thing is when Shiv looks at Kendall and says, I just don't think you'd be very good at it. 
And, yeah. and one of the, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, God. I don't even. Pain, I don't, pain. You're lying. You're, I, don't, I don't. I don't even think you actually believe. And he becomes like a seven year old child again. He becomes that seven year old child Literally. that his father said you can run the company. And so, oh my God, you know, it's uh, speaking of which, and and I, I and I forgive me for this, but one of the things you know, Nagin, I love you, but one of the things I deeply resent is that you did not have me on on every episode of the Succession <laughs> podcast. And since you didn't have me on last week, I need to say that Please. even though. You, even though your recap was great and you saw these things that I saw and many, many more things that I didn't see, you didn't mention perhaps oh, top five lines, top five okay. dramatic moments, which is when Roman breaks down at the funeral and he says, sobbing to his siblings, is dad really in there pointing yeah. at the coffin? Yeah. Can you yeah. get him out? Can you get him out? And that yeah. was such an amazing moment because it clarified something that goes back to something Benari just said. These are all children. They're children in really expensive grown-up clothes. Yeah. And 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 when and when Kendall says he said that to me when I was seven, he's still seven. Yeah. He's still dealing with that incredible mind fuck. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I've completely lost my train of thought. But no, yes, but that's the key to all of this. <laughs> no, I think. I think that that's so true. And I think if you're searching for something, and like you said, we could do grad student level theses for forever on these. I mean, there, there will be, there will be dramaturgically speaking, yes. we'll, be, we'll be speaking of this, but Shiv is pregnant. Yeah. She is the bloodline. And I know Roman says that really oh, cool thing to Kendall, which is what set, it, sets him off and we can come back. Well, to that's that what about, dad said. You know, his adopted kid. And maybe I think IVF for the first kid, yeah. maybe she had an affair, you know, there, it's, it's it's left ambiguous, but she she as look as the mom, we know it's her kid, so we know that's Roy offspring. But also, if Tom becomes CEO, that's double offspring. Her best protection in this overtly sexist, inherently misogynistic system that she is stuck within, that has been screwing her left and right, even though she's tried to navigate her way through it. Her best protection for her child for her future is tom that's because that's the proximity of power one thing these kids have been taught and it's one thing that they've kept using is like oh well we'll we'll make the nazi president because that's good for our deal we'll make a deal with madsen because that's good for the shareholder like all these deals that they've made have blown up in their faces and the last deal left for shiv is to actually shiv her family but protect her future that she's not going to be happy with, but that's her best play that she has left. But the other crazy thing to me about th this is why the Shiv thing, ah, I bristle. I bristle mm -hmm. at, at that at that choice, and I'm not even sure that it totally makes that much narrative sense that she would have that moment because this is, it's like, she's acting as if we're in medieval times and a blacksmith has a blacksmith son who's also has the last name blacksmith right like that's not what's happening anymore her what her children are going to go be improv comedians you know what i mean like god this, forbid like, nagin <laughs> how why would you wish that <laughs> in such a but maybe i mean how many now shiv is terrible but why does she deserve that come on <laughs> But you know what I mean? It's like, I, I, do. I don't even understand why we're even think why the, the line matters at all. I mean, I, it's such a ridiculous line. thought, the yeah. bloodline. I, you I, know? I, I kind of, I, if, if the dispute for the moment is between Shiv being calculating, deciding what's best for her and her children and Shiv acting in her emotion of the moment, I'm more of the latter, I guess, which is Nagin. Right. Yeah, and, and I do has, think it's. I think it's an. I do think it's an emotional. I think her walking away is that emotional moment because it's one thing if she's one vote of ten, but she's the deciding right, vote. Right. So right. she needs a moment, and like you said, I think then it cascades. She right. needs to think it through. The brothers come rushing in. Kendall's reverts to Kendall. Romans, and she looks at them, and they're the fuck brothers. Yeah, you know, and and like I think what she's looking at is like you're still children none of this is going well we can't do this and i can't be the person makes the vote to decide right this yeah because and because one of the more important things that happens in the episode it happens early when shiv calls or is in the phone with tom and actually tries to oh, reconcile yeah. with him yeah and i think it's really important that that happen a when she thinks she's going to be the ceo yes 
and B, when she has no idea that he's going to be instead. The same thing, but two sides of it. So at that moment, she's, and, and, and when she says, you know, when it comes to relationships, I have this problem and I'm not good at the underneath stuff, which was brilliantly inarticulate. And you really get this sense that she's not maneuvering when it comes to Tom. And yeah. also in that amazing, you know, icon, well, soon to be iconic shot of them in the limo driving away. I mean, I, I, I would have loved to be there for the rehearsals. <laughs> like what's the opposite of an intimacy coordinator, a, a physical, <laughs> physical indication of discomfort coordinator. A, a repulsion right. coordinator. Right. We talked, well, the last time I was on, we talked about whoever, whoever like did the underline in, in Logan's notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whoever choreographed the handhold, Tom putting out his hand, her looking, reaching over and just resting her hand lightly on it. Him not grasping it, but just closing his fingers a little Ew, bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you could feel you it. had to do like hand, like muscle exercises yes, exactly. to make all to of that, that work. And it's like, I can imagine that in, you know, the director going, no, no, we're going to take it again. But this time, this time, just a little less, a little less affection on the pinky, please. Yeah. It was so perfect because it indicated that both of them are willing. Neither of them may be able to save yeah. this relationship, which to Can me I again- Can I also say about, yeah, yeah. that Shiv, um, I, in my twenties, could truly never utter an emotion. Like, I mean, to, to anyone, but especially to the men I was dating. And I remember the first time I tried, to, I had this long time boyfriend. I mean, we were together for like years. And I, I like literally, like, remember the first time I tried to be like, oh, I guess I, um, if you had to put it in words, I would say that I, uh, I suppose that I, um, I love you or whatever. So anyways, I'm going to go. And I was just like, that's how I did it. I was. And so when she, she was having that DTR, like to find the relationship conversation with Tom, I was like, oh, that's so me in my twenties. And that's something that, that I feel is really true about all these characters is that even they're, they're all in their thirties and they're adults. They have a like sort of like delayed adulthood, all of them. And I think that one of the things with Shiv in that moment, it's not just that Kendall's seven years old and telling um, and being told by his father that he's the one. It's that they're all seven years old yep. and they cannot view each other. You know, she was just like, you always thought you were the one, you know? <laughs> it's but there's like an interesting, the same there's thing. An they're interesting all seven. Parallel there between the love and affection she didn't get from her father in a position of power. And then all the love, like he was a lap dog for her. He was desperately in love with her in actuality. Oh. And he liked the money and power and was very upfront about what he wanted and what he liked about the world she lived in. But he loved her and he was desperately in love with her. And so she's now sort of gone from daddy wouldn't give me any affection to this guy who she knows when it's, when they're in the thick of it, this guy will shower me with love and affection this you know maybe and, mm. and i don't know that she i don't know that she knows what she wants but like tom said to her you don't like to fail a test do you Shiv? yeah, you, Shiv? yeah. it would also and he, calls her, and he calls her siobhan too which is also yeah, 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 a, a yeah. very nice little little touch I, I i also think it's important to remember and this isn't disagreeing with anything you just said benari but going back to the beginning of the relationship in the first season or two leading up to and beyond their wedding she was shitty to him. Oh, remember, so shitty. Remember Terrible. Her, remember her telling him on their wedding night, oh, by the way, we have yeah. an open marriage. Yeah. Well, he's and a sponge pain. He's a pain he's a, he's a pain, he's pain sponge. sponge. And, there's <laughs> that, sponge. and there's that amazing line. And I mean, Danielle, who I, you know is not here, and, and God bless her, is, is your resident expert on the lives and culture of the 1%. I am, unless Benari, you have a history I don't know about, or Nagin, I'm pretty sure you don't have this history. I am the expert here on horrible dysfunctional marriages. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's and, and there's that amazing line. I, I wish I had looked it up that Tom says to her, I, I don't know if the happiness you the happiness you give me is worth the incredible unhappiness I'm feeling or something like that. Yeah, it's like the, the, beach, the, the, yeah. the pain, it's like the pain I feel with you is worse than the pain, pain I feel I, without you. Exactly. Like, uh, exactly. And, and you know, Tom has Tom has been on a journey, and one of the things that propelled him on this journey was how shitty Siobhan was to him. And I think in his climb, one of the things he looked forward to and has grabbed at every opportunity, his various betrayals of Siobhan, 
is to reverse the power dynamic. So she's no longer, he's no longer dependent. And in some ways, hasn't she prepared him for this moment? Because he's exactly what Mattson is looking for. An a lap dog. A lap dog, um, an empty suit with no principles, no real values, no point of view beyond whatever the people yeah. in charge need and want. I will make you money because it's good for me and my power. And a, highly, a, a highly interchangeable modular <laughs> part, she I says. I wrote that down too. No, he says, I think he says that. What she says about him, and she says it to Madsen by way of insulting him. And I bet if you went back, you could see and Alexander like, Skarsgård go, hmm. Yeah. She says, he'll just suck the biggest dick in the room. And Skarsgård is saying to himself, well, wait a minute. I have the biggest dick, don't I? I think, I think we found our new CEO. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And- All right, well, folks, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back, we shall continue. And we are back. Um, all right. So we're sort of like going through, um, we're sort of all over the place, but let's yeah. uh let's keep on this this ending and what it means um for Tom. So Tom, the lap dog, takes the seat. Um I want to say something about whether or not these are serious people. Madsen is also to me not at all a serious person. He overpaid. He did an Elon Musk, right? Like this is written before, I think, yes. maybe written before we knew the price and all that, that, that what Elon, Elon Musk did for Twitter. But this is this is the Twitter deal. I mean, in, in essence, you know what I mean? I don't think Madsen is playing this brilliantly. He doesn't even code, which is like a fact that I never want to forget. The man doesn't even code. He's not the brilliant guy that everyone thinks he is. This is all just like he's just in the position, you know. So I, I, I wonder is is Tom on top or is he just miserable forever? And is Matson um is Matson on top? I, oh wow, jeez, I, Tom I think is as he says capable of great misery, and that may be you know if if you want to talk about personal growth, somebody achieving that. Tom did in the course of this episode when he realized <laughs> yeah. what he is. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure if, his value if, add. His value add is I'm a pain is to be the pain sponge is to be the interchangeable cog, and that's something he has learned in the course of this season. That what he was able to do for to advance in the world. And I mean, in a weird way, he proved himself to Logan by betraying his wife. Yeah. Right. And, that and, was like, and wanting to go to jail. He was like, I will go to jail for you. Right. He learned over the course of this episode what it is he can bring, what value added he brings. And that is absolute abnegation. <laughs> and so that, and so I think he accepts it. And there is, uh, it's, it's so fun. I, I guess it was a coincidence. So we've got this little baby, as Nagin knows, and the baby woke up just after the boardroom scene where, where Frank says, it's over. And so we had to pause it while my wife went to tend to the baby. And the shot was that amazing shot of, of the newly throned Tom strolling down the corridor now with his entourage and the grin in his face. And, and Matthew McFadden in his talk is standing so tall. And you know, he completely understands that he is the pain sponge. He's the interchangeable part, but he's so happy. Yeah. He's so happy to finally not be well. I was about to say not be dependent, but to he, reach he, that all thing he his wants, way. It, what he kind of wants in life is for a lot of people to be gregging for him. Yes, yes. he and just he wants, finally I, gets a ton of people to be and, gregging for and him. And I think it's very important to also note that in the end, Tom, who who is crowned the winner without what yeah. is he won, the two people he loves most have betrayed him the most he's left with he's left with shiv Shiv. and greg right but he but as a you know his his magnanimous act as new king is to forgive greg by placing the sticker from the the logan roy fire sale to claim to claim your logan property he claims greg in the end and it's such a nice beautiful little moment between the two of them parenthetical moment when they went to the scene in the apartment where uh connor was running the whole thing and giving out the things that you know the first round and the second round 
I said to myself, why are they doing this as characters? Why are they doing this on the morning of the biggest board meeting of their dramaturgically. life? Dramaturgically. Dramaturgically. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But it was entirely to set up that yep. moment of him putting the sticky dot on Greg's forehead. That's yep. what it was for. But you're, you know, you, well, I forget the line. I, there were so many good lines and I wrote them. I didn't write them all down and I don't want to get them wrong. But he says, you know, you're a piece of shit. You're an absolute piece of shit, but you're my piece of shit. Dot. Boom. Yes. So good. Oh, so my good. God. But, but I also think that Tom is very much like, uh, it, it's like Kevin McCarthy. The only thing he wants is the, <laughs> is the, is the title and, yeah. the, and, 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 everything that goes along with that and he he's married care. to marjorie taylor green yeah, and he will and he will debase himself oh, that's me to, no to oh, keep I, that i'm kidding but he, will de- he will debase you're right himself. that's a very good that's a very good i mean you're right because presumably the conventional wisdom about kevin mccarthy is he just wants to say he's speaker speaker yeah. of the house yeah. he wants the office he wants the, the portrait in the <laughs> hall yeah and in order to get that he's willing to give up all of the power that normally comes with it like for right. example, what is Tom Wamsgams? Um, <laughs> what is Tom Wamsgams? Wamsgams? Uh, Wamsgams. Agenda for the for the massive media conglomerate that is Waystar Royco. He has none. He, he has says none. that to to uh, to Matson. He says, you know, I, you know, I'm, the customer's always right, and if they want red meat and hot tar, that's what I'll give them. He has no vision. Right. He has no ambition. Other than, as you say, to have the office, to sit in the chair, to have the power and money so people have to Greg for him. And I think there's a little bit of commentary as well and condemnation of our current American power structure. Because remember, these are Brits writing the show. So they they pull no punches and they have no uh, sense of sympathy or sentimentality. Allegiance. About, about yeah, what, yeah. We're, what we're going through. But when you look at what the modern power structure, these are not the, these are not the J.P. Morgans and the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers of old, the modern day Robin Bar- uh, robber barons, you know, roll over for, you know, the biggest stick in the room. And, and there's also the moment when, when he's, when Matson is offering Tom the, the, the job and he's, he's basically saying soft pitch me, he lays it out for him. He cucks him. He's like, I want to fuck your wife. Yeah. And, yes. uh, but I, I'll make you CEO. So are you good with that? And Tom's like, yes, I am in. Specifically you, what you, he you, says was, and I wrote this down, he says, we're men. <laughs> yeah, that's that's something. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Bernard, you'll back me up here. <laughs> We're men. We're men. This is this is how we men talk. <laughs> when, Completely. When, when, Completely. When somebody right. says to me, "Oh, I want to fuck yeah. your wife," yeah. my constant reaction is, "Well, that's cool. Yeah. That's <laughs> all right." But the real question is, "What's yeah. in it for me?" So that's well, and, and very much. why have you know the baby lady when I can get the man the, who put the put baby in the baby, the baby yeah. lady, <laughs> which is you know, which also goes to your point, Nagin, of Matson is not smart not he's not smart. like really he's, he's not, not a serious, serious person he also like reduced everything to oh it's just about gossip and uh what was it about something in gossip and you know he's like this is easy and i'm like that's actually and 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 everyone's been clear like this is it only elon musk this is a melange of people but this is what Elon Musk thinks that Twitter would be easy and he's running it into the ground, right? right. Like, so the, the 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 reduction of everything into just these like simple parts is what Madsen does. He's not a serious person. Let us move on to Roman. Now, the final scene of Roman is he sits and he goes to sit down in the bar. He orders himself a martini. He takes a sip and he smiles. Right. Um. Roman is free and 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 maybe the most accepting of him of them all of of this freedom that he now has uh what did you what did you make of it I I, I think it's an interesting ending for him because mm-hmm. uh, some people have said and I agree it's a happy ending because out of all of them we knew that Roman was the least suited to this and yes. and by that virtue the most pathetic by virtue of his needing to seek it he was never going to do. In fact, it, I also think an even more important moment for Roman is when he says the thing that all of us have known, and they've probably known the whole time, but never admitted to themselves. This is, we're all bullshit. This is all mm-hmm. bullshit. Yep. We're bullshit. None of us are good at this. None of us deserve this. This is all meaningless because it's bullshit. And 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 his he's fine. You know, if enlightenment 
if a happy ending is enlightenment, getting to the truth, he's enlightened at the end. He's just going to go and be, first of all, one of the things nobody mentions, we haven't mentioned yet, these people are going to be God level wealthy for the rest of their yeah, life. They all yeah. made billions of dollars. They're and their children of- and their children will also be God level wealthy and it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. And he's going to go off in his life and have his weird sexual things with other older ladies looking for the mom slash lover he never really had. And or he's- looking for, you know, dudes to beat him up and cause or him something. Pain. Something. <laughs> or something. Yeah. 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 By the way, I, I mean, jerk I, dungeon. <laughs> we, we all, we all admire. We all admire the show for so many reasons it may be literally him reopening his wound oh. <laughs> might have been a little a little too on the nose <laughs> but yeah i think roman roman i don't know what he's going to do uh but roman it's, and scott in contrast to kendall is going to be fine because roman's like yeah it turns out this whole thing was all bullshit and none of us deserve to do this and we're all pointless so yes yeah, and I think that he struggled with the how destructive this life made him and how harmful it was to him. He's the most abused of the children, yeah. physically and, and yeah. mentally. And um, also and also in many ways the worst. And and, and that made him a Nazi. I, I think that there is a very clear parallel to the sort of toxicity of of toxic masculinity and the effect on white men and look he comes from privilege but like look how he takes it out on other people right he's got the incel vibe he's got the incel vibe but yet ironically was the most empathetic of all of them he's the one who goes to to carry he's the one who he's the one who goes running to mom you know and and he's the one i remember um, a wonderful moment was when he went to save kendall when kendall fell massively off the wagon yeah yeah. There have been moments from him in which he actually was capable of empathy and kindness. And also, the reason I didn't want to watch this show the first time I tried it He's awful was because of yeah. what he does to that <laughs> little kid in the pilot. Yeah. I'm yes. like, fuck these people. Fuck a show that wants me to enjoy an action like that. And uh, then, of course, I, I came back and here we and all are. Kieran Culkin uh, yeah. just, you know, masterfully uh, Tremendous. wins over. <laughs> yeah. What are you, so, Nagin? Hmm. Nagin, I feel like we have been very Matson and Tom. <laughs> and aside. What did you think of it? Yes. What's the, what's the what's the baby lady thing? So <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I th- you know, <clears throat> so as listeners know, I I've been very team Kendall this entire time. So I really did think that they were that Kendall had been groomed. Kendall was right. Like Kendall had been groomed this whole time. He was told when he was seven. I mean, and they were maybe all told at varying levels or whatever, but Kendall like then walked the walk, right? Like he lived in Shanghai. He ran the whatever LA division. You know what I mean? Like he did all of those things. And I think he honestly still, like, I feel like (laughs) this feels dumb today, but I feel like it still could have gone his way and it would have been a satisfying ending because it still would have felt empty. It would have felt empty to then run this decaying empire. So now, okay, Madsen gets to run a decaying empire or whatever, maybe disassemble it for parts or whatever he's planning on doing. But it it it's still like, um, you know, linear television and all these things. And as we all know, what's happening literally right now with with the uh, with us uh, with streamers and there's a writer strike and there, it's just like the media landscape is really extremely unstable like literally at this moment and so um i i felt like it could still literally could have been kendall it would have made absolute sense and i would have been happy i felt with the tom ending i guess as empty i felt like as empty as tom and shiv looked you know yeah. driving away yeah. i was like oh Okay, I, I, in I, I'm, I, I, get, I bristled at the at the Shiv moment, her walking away, all of that. I felt like it didn't make sense to me. Just moments prior, she was so fucking pissed that Tom was being named CEO, right? And she was like, "Let's get him, get on the phone. Let's, we're gonna get this guy." She was walking in formation. I mean. And then the next moment, she's like putting her limp hand on his hand. I don't know if but that. That part felt a little like, mm, I don't know. I mean, I it's it's great. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it's a great ending. But it did leave, leave me just with some questions. It left you um, like Shiv's limp hand. Is how it, it, left, left you. it left me like Shiv's limp hand, but right? I, and, then, and I think that that's what they wanted. I think yeah. that was the intention 
Jesse Armstrong's intention. I think he wanted, I, I heard, you know, I, I heard the um, podcast, the HBO official podcast and Jeremy Strong was interviewed and they did a take it where Jeremy Strong goes over the rail like he's going to jump. He doesn't actually jump or whatever. But and then and then Colin comes and like stops him. Did they really? They did wow. a take like that. And then he obviously didn't use it. They use the take where he's sitting and staring at the ocean. Now, let me because I am Nagin Farsad. These are the thoughts I had as he's staring into the ocean. Because let's remember, Kendall has come back from worse. Yes. yes. And what's worse is he was privy to a death murder. So oh, yes, we can't... have to talk about that. But no, on. no, I made that up. So... I made it up. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> right, right, right. So like in season two or whatever, he, he come, he's a broken person. He goes back yes. to using drugs, blah, blah, blah. But then he comes back from that. I, if if we think he's staring out into the ocean, he, to me, he's having a bad day. It's going to be a really terrible month. But he's going to come back because that's what he does. Also, he's God level wealthy. So he doesn't need to. Also, he's got a good grief guy. Like he does not <laughs> need to stew in this forever. And, 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 and Jeremy Strong said, like in his interview, in my view, he lo lost everything. He lost his family. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't I don't buy that because Kendall is the guy that gets broken and then builds himself back up and then gets broken and then builds himself back up. But Jesse Armstrong in the post episode chat, you know, they do on HBO, the episode extras, says something, I believe, to the effect of this is all that Kendall has ever wanted. And, and I think that if you go back, Nagini, and you look back at his rebuildings, and you're right, he's been through worse. He almost drowned, in fact, as we remember in that swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Every time he came back propelled by the same thing, he either kill his father metaphorically or be beloved for, for his father. Now it's all gone. It's over. He will never be the CEO of 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 of, of uh, Waystar Royco. Royco, thank you. He will never be his father. And I genuinely think I think Jesse Armstrong said something like this. That will be the central moment of his life for however long it is. And if he was happy being a billionaire, if that what gave him poppy, happiness, already rich, then he would have been happy. Already rich, then we would exactly. And then he would have been happy when we met him. Can, right? Can I no, no. I I mean, I totally get. I I also think it's. <laughs> I think everyone wants a company of people gregging for them. And I think that like, if, if, if Kendall has it to me, cause this was a loose, to me, a loose end was the Pierce deal. So can I, it was oh, a I'm very so frustrating loose end. And, and uh, to me, I was just like, well then take Pierce and then, Fuck Waystar. Like, you know what I mean? If the, the but, goal it is to like, but it doesn't anymore. matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because the bullshit. father's not there to kill anymore. Right, right, also, right. Also, can I make the comparison? I'm so, because I want, I was going to bring this up. Ken can't get Roystar Waco. That's all he wants. Logan couldn't get PGN. He spent his whole life chasing that white whale. And in the right. end, in the end, the kids fucked him on that deal. Right. Yeah. They just prevented him from getting it. That's the only purpose that served. None of these people will ever get what they actually want. But from our vantage point, we're looking at them like, why are they so unhappy? They're all obscenely wealthy. None. They're just rearranging their status. But their status is still better than 99 percent of the people in the rest of the world. And that's the I think that this is really what it what it comes down to is that it is all bullshit. And. I think about this line from Logan where he says, what are people? They're markets. He views the people as markets. So if we're looking at them as markets, what are Kendall, Shiv, and Roy as markets? When they work together, they were at their strongest. They were at their peak, right? That's socialism. But they couldn't make it work because they were bred into capitalism and this idea of aggressive competition makes everything better. But that's toxic and doomed to failure and it ruins all of them. And if they could have just gotten their shit together and gotten past all of their shit, if Shiv could have gotten over her shit, if Kendall could stop just being yeah. Kendall for one second and not discuss Shiv and not bully Roman, like they could have made it happen. But they can't because they were put into a system that was doomed for them to fail in. This brings me to the kitchen scene. I need to dramaturgically discuss the kitchen scene. <laughs> I, I feel because... like I'm being disrespected here. <laughs> <laughs> the kitchen scene, it put it 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 put us in 
such a false sense of comfort. Yes. It gave us such a false sense. We were so ho- happy, hopeful. We were able to forget for a moment like that any of it was happening. Um, it gave, it made me feel like, you know what? A happy future is possible for everybody. Let's just stay in this kitchen forever. Um, and then what's and was so brilliant to me is they gave us just that such an intense jolt of joy yeah. to break us so hard I with, know. Like, with but- Kendall fucking putting his fingers in Roman's eyes. Um, those, oh, yeah. those wobbly oh, yeah. things rolling around face, in its face. Uh, oh God. Hang on a second. I wrote oh. it down. Face <laughs> eggs. Face, face eggs. eggs. Um, let you me ask like you guys, <laughs> you're absolutely right, Nagin. And, and further, I mean, it was so lovely to see them. And this may be, is it really the first time other than some mordant bonding around their father's death earlier this season? But no, that's not right. There have been other moments. Uh, I think like, they were on a boat or something. Yeah, when, when, or when, others, yeah. when Kendall confesses to them both sitting on the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. killed the yeah. kid. There have been moments where they have been loving and supportive siblings of each other. And those yeah. truly have been beautiful. And and this one was, and you're absolutely yeah. right. And, and, you're, and I think that's why it was there. It was such an odd and interesting scene, dramaturgically, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the decision has been made um, they swim out to the raft, which was an interesting staging, and say to him, we anoint you. They didn't need, to, in terms of plot, to have that scene in the kitchen. It's already decided. But to show them together, to show them looking forward to a future together as siblings, to feel like they've won, they've actually defeated their demons, when of course they haven't, was really important. And further, uh, Mark Mylott, again, interviewed on the thing. He said that uh, he indicated that the, the, the sequence in Barbados with their mother's house was the last thing they shot, right? In the entire oh. series, they got everything and then went down there. Mm-hmm. And although I, I'm at least smart enough um, uh, about filmmaking to know that that doesn't mean that the kitchen scene was the last thing they shot. That could have been a sound stage back in New York. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'd love to think that the last thing these actors got to do together was, was that something scene, fun. Was something fun in which they are expressing affection and dumping goop in each other's head. I think that would that would be lovely for everyone. It's, it's, but yeah, it really does set you up. And it reminds us that they're they're kids. They're, they're kids. They grew up together, and there's like that a bond, which is why I think it to me, even though literally the like creator of the show is like it's a tragedy, it's Kendall's tragedy, and I'm like, no, you're wrong. He's gonna rise again because. <laughs> Because what does he know? (laughs) The guy knows nothing. The three of them literally can never actually be separated. I think that's the reality that they always come back to each other because they're actually the only actual friends they have. That which is something that's so true and so weird in the course of four seasons of this show. None of these people have indicated or had a relationship outside the family. There's yeah. no scene. I mean, like, you know, a little Stewie, Stewie, a, a little, little Stewie, Stewie. 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 Little and, Stewie. And, and, and believe me, I, you, you can imagine how <laughs> thrilled I was to discover that they went to Harvard together. He and Stewie, that was an early <laughs> season reveal. Um, yeah, because it turns out that Kendall was a business guy at the Lampoon, which has a lot of semiotic meetings for people like me. Oh, um, yes. Mm-hmm. It means he wasn't talented. He was adjacent to talent, but that's another story. And even Stewie, he <laughs> says they're friends. I mean, he even says to Stewie in the sense, I know you, I know yeah. what you're like. He says, bullshit, you like pancakes and waffles and you kiss guys when you're on Molly. You're not heart of darkness. You're grilled cheese with a sucked dick. <laughs> Which is, is he right? I don't know. But the point is none of these people have relationships no. outside this. Yeah. Stewie immediately, congr- like Stewie votes against the deal and then immediately congratulates Madsen and the new board. Like, hey, yeah. right. Like, it doesn't matter for them. Yeah, they're none they're of them. so fluid. It, there's there's, there's right. no friendships. There are alliances. And they but you're come right. and the, they go. The closeness of the siblings, and I think it's one thing the show really nails, and I think it's one of the things that makes it successful and overcome the revulsion we would feel for these characters because they get the sibling stuff so right. Those relationships, when it's not business, when they're when they're dealing with what they've lived through. And let's also re- remember their mom brought them down there. She used Roman as a manipulative tool to get them down there. She so says her. she just, she just wants a family dinner and then brings Peter in to sell them some condo deal from his friend who's on the outs because Peter's a freaking con artist as well. Like none of them, none of them have real moments with 
with each other and even in you know in in their in their uh, weakest moment with their mom when she's being the most motherly it's still a fucking put on it's still like i'm just going to turn you over to my associate now who's going to tell you about a great timeshare you know <laughs> <laughs> you're allowed to have a terrible dinner but you have to watch this film <laughs> yeah yeah also she and doesn't so- <laughs> make them enough food it's like yeah, because uh, she's not oh, a real if, mom if, if, she's not a real mom if, that's such a great touch if, there's if, no food in this refrigerator if, and you can't eat peter's cheese no, if, <laughs> like, she's just like oh i know it's not it's not very much but we'll go to this place and have breakfast Breakfast. It's if, like what you didn't even you're not even feeding them enough if, food. At if this Danielle, meal. if Danielle were here, I'm sure she would tell <laughs> us all that none of these people have any idea how to cook. No, yeah. none of them. <laughs> they've been cooked for their entire life. I, Although really good experience. at freezing knobs, I guess. Freezing really knobs. She doesn't like the knobs, and she saves them. Oh my Frozen god. Knobs. I, I, I imagine we're getting to the end. Uh, yeah. Let, let me say. One of the thing I most love about this TV show, there's so many things to love, but as I've gotten older and I am older, the thing I have less and less tolerance for is typical TV bullshit or movie mm-hmm. bullshit where people mm-hmm. just act like characters. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways in which act like characters, which I find bullshit, is characters are dumber than the viewer. The classic right. cliche example is the horror movie where it's like, don't go into that room. We know you shouldn't go into the room. They are dumb. They go into the room. And that plays out in much more subtle ways in so many things where you're looking at a character and you see a character manipulating another character. And you know that second character is being manipulated, but the second character doesn't for some reason. You just have to buy that they're too dumb to see. Right. To see. In this show, everybody sees everything. These guys have watched Succession. One of my very <laughs> favorite moments to yeah. indicate this is when Tom is trying to bullshit that moment where Tom is trying to bullshit Shiv. Yeah. Oh, really? You're not going to be the CEO? Shiv sees it immediately. Yeah. That is consistent through the show. They all know who they are. The only people they lie about is themselves. Right. Which is why when when uh, when Roman has that moment, we're all bullshit. This is all bullshit. He's finally seeing the thing that we've all seen. When yeah. she says, you're not going to be any good at it. She's seen it too. And that's the thing I, I ultimately love about this show, that these characters are, are as smart as we are in the audience. They're seeing the same goddamn things that we see, even though it's often played for laughs, and laughs depend a lot of times on people being oblivious. They manage to be so clear-eyed about the world they're in. And that's one of the reasons it's like one of the greatest shows, because yes. at no point are we ever asked to buy as audience members that these people are kind of dumb. And, and and I think what's also very nice about this is the show itself plays with our expectations. That scene, a, a lesser show would give you that, well, the kids came together somehow and they made the deal happen and whatever. And it's very sentimental and that's not the show. The show has to, the show to, to and to be sick, to get to that boardroom scene, to really make you feel the pain and the impact and also the confusion I love that it's ambiguous why Shiv walks out. We can have we can have any number of reasons. We don't know. We don't even know if Shiv knows why she walks out in that moment. But it gives every character an opportunity to be who they are in that moment. They can't help themselves. Ken can't help fucking it up. And really, the the final nail in his coffin is lying about the one thing that he that he was that he admitted to his. His siblings, the one moment that really brought them together and brought this bond together was that, you know, they forgave him. He he confessed what he had done and they they were like, it's not your fault, man. And and then to lie and they know that like, wow, well, yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Right. You're so full of shit now. Like, fuck you. You made a mockery of, of everything. You've made a mess of this whole thing. And so I think in that moment, that's what makes that kind of heartbreaking, too, is that like we were we were seeing a glimpse of like what could be and and as you're looking at as a viewer you're like i don't know if if they're watching a film of their dad having a dinner and they're crying and this feels like closure and it doesn't feel like the show it doesn't feel like the show right. because because this show doesn't do that doesn't do that which is what which is the other funny thing dramaturgically is that like <laughs> when they're having a conversation on the when 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 um, Shiv and Roman are having a conversation on the beach and Roman's on the dock and it feels and they're talking about mur- joking about murdering Murder. him 
in that you they cut to Kendall lying there on the dock and the dock is, you know, it's 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 unsteady. Right. It's yeah. like in the waves. And I, you feel like, oh, is you have that moment like, is Kendall going to fall off and drown? Like you have these uh, ridiculous things, but that's never the show gives you these little things. These little is he going to kill Roman? Is he going to choke right. Roman out? They feel they feel like, oh, my God, there's going to be these unstable. There's, gonna be, there's these little nuggets of instability. But the show is like, no, we don't do that. That's like ridiculous, schlocky television. Yeah. We're, we're, and we no don't do ridiculous, schlocky. Twi- yeah, yeah. We don't do schlocky television. There's everything is set up in a way that it is believable to you. Um, and uh, and I thought that was excellent. And I think just in terms of where it is in the pantheon of television, I think it's a good way to kind of end this, con- to to close up our recap here. I mean, I, I, will, I will always think that Breaking Bad is just the best show that ever was. Um, and I think I'm going to put Succession up in the top three. And I also controversially put Lost in the top three, just because I feel like Lost was a show that started all of this uh, prestige television trend. Not The Sopranos? Interesting. And I am not a, I am someone who has not actually watched The Sopranos. All right, you got to watch The Sopranos. So yeah, so we will, uh, I will, I will um, maybe readjust my rankings, but where, where, I mean, so is this show for you one of the best of all time where where are you guys on where this show is i i can only it's it's hard because you know how do you compare these things like you say breaking bad is brilliant breaking bad is amazing i uh, there was a time when i thought breaking bad was the best tv show i'd ever seen but i also thought the thing about the sopranos you know i also thought that about game of thrones which i was absolutely obsessed with for a lot of excellent reasons all i can tell you is because of my weird low, uh, if you wanted to be uh, charitable to, you, to me, you'd say my low tolerance for bullshit. If you wanted to be critical of me, you'd say because I'm a goddamn snob. <laughs> there haven't been a lot of TV shows that have gotten me as emotionally mm-hmm. invested. And I've just mentioned about all of them. So I would put succession on this list. However, I, I just want to throw in because it, it, it's there, there are certain things that I know not a lot of people love, but I love profoundly. And because I'm kind of in grossly speaking a minority it's more important to me the leftovers is oh one of my, yeah uh, leftovers my, i mean by the way a lost dna i leftovers. know i yeah. know and also going forward watchmen but that's Watch, another story. I, I would say watchmen as well as, as um, an amazing show but yeah to me like i said the reason this show it was so compelling ultimately is because of its insanely clear-eyed view of what these what people are really like and and that to me, if you start there, uh, if you start and keep to an actual vision of what people are like rather than what characters are like, TV characters, then you, you've got a huge leg up with me. And then everything else they gave us, these performances and these shots. Oh, by the way, speaking of shots, the, the fact that the climax took place in glass walled rooms. Oh my the God. The fact that everybody Brilliant. could see the three siblings fighting each other. The fact that when Kendall walks out, that shot of, of, of the tracking Kendall out, uh, and there are all these people behind him, not looking at him, looking at him, just walking out through these vague shadows of people was astoundingly good television. Yeah, very good. Um, th- and there, all the extra stuff, it, it's all brilliant. It's amazing. The writing, the dialogue, we've quoted already 10,000 great lines. Uh, but it all starts with this unerring vision of what actual people would really do in these situations. And I, I can't but love it for that. And can I add one more thing about the the where it is in the Pantheon? It It's doing a thing about talking about, I think Mad Men did this, where it like talks about American society yes. in a way that I think none, you know, I don't, again, I haven't seen Sopranos, but um, I would say Breaking Bad isn't necessarily doing, it's more talking more insularly about human nature, whatever, but like th- this is making huge commentaries on American society. And one of the things that I think is true from the Carnegies to today and was stated, I think, in, in Kendall's eulogy was that what Logan did is he sort of quickened the pace of desire to to make things and to get things and to have things. And that I think that quickened pace, the desire, desire is such a thing that is is such a part of American life. We're comparison machines. All we do is like wish we had more, wish we had more wealth, wish we had more this, wish we had more that. 
And I think this show is a real reminder of like that desire and what uh, what it ultimately wrought, which is misery for for Tom and Shiv, who will just continue on into an unhappy, limp handed future. Yeah. And I, I do. I think that it nails the moment. I think that it really encapsulates a moment in time and uh, reveals something about us culturally, um, politically, ethically. Um, and what what are the things that are important? And I think I'm glad you brought up the the the, the funeral, because I think that 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 moment in lesser hands, you in speech ends the mm -hmm. episode because that's the condemnation yeah. Of, yeah. Of, of everything. Ewan speaks the truth and says he has wrought terrible, terrible evil on this world and he has unleashed terrible things in me and and fed a meagerness in men. And that's what has happened. But then Kendall gets up there and kind of makes makes a, a, a eulogy that doesn't really say anything. He's like, it's money. We made money and I hope I make money and money. And everyone applauds yeah. him <laughs> because they've all been shown. They've all been told to their faces who and what they yeah. are. But then there is no accountability. There is no self-reflection because someone gets up there and tells them, but it's going to be OK. And the world keeps spinning and everything keeps moving forward. And we know it's wrong, but we're going to keep doing it till we all die. And, and someone will 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 keep going. And I think that that's part of the brilliance of the show is that it's very Shakespearean, but it's very human and very relatable. And uh, just another plug, uh, pay your writers and your directors and your actors <laughs> yeah. uh, because they are yes. more than just content creators. Th this this has done what I think. Are you saying like uh, the uh, chat GPT couldn't have written this episode? <laughs> Look, uh, you know, if, <laughs> oh. you know what? I think uh, I, I, uh, I, I, they even they even reference that where they're calling like Greg chatbot and they're making AI jokes and like, yeah, I'll just oh, have yeah, that's like, right. AI shit something out because that's what the world wants. The, the people portrayed in the show are the people who think that you just turn a profit and and how do I minimize costs? And Tom's just, you know, laying off staff members and going more and more to computers and lackeys. And the reality is, is that what makes life worth living is the soul. That's like, you can't, you can't fake the soul of things. And when, and when we respond, why do we like these characters? Because we glimpse that there's still some soul left in there. They have human interactions. They have human, they have human reactions to things. And when that reflects something, that's what brings us catharsis. That's drama. That's the importance of drama. That's the importance of comedy and tragedy in our lives and the importance of art. Because hopefully we watch a show like this and even though they didn't learn anything, maybe we've learned something as a society. Maybe we can take something back into the real world and say, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Maybe we can work together for progress and, and for the betterment. We don't have to make shitty decisions uh, where the only legacy we'll be left with is that we've made this world worse. Maybe and Benari, I say amen to that. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. We, can we, can we, uh, you guys remember from the last time I was on this show, I'm a Connor stan. So <laughs> oh, say, that's right. Uh, we didn't say anything about that. You're Connor. a fellow say, con head. Fellow con head. I, I fellow con head. I, I'm, I, it kind of made me sad that the last we see of Connor and Willa is they're already planning and getting the fuck away from each other as the Rome, second week the itch. second week itch and and this is this is again i've referenced this before i used to be a dramatist a playwright when when willis says well i'm going to have a play reading in six or eight months i just <laughs> died i just <laughs> died because remember willa is quote unquote a playwright yeah. Yes, and that's, that's right. and, like, and that's why i'm going to stay in this 65 million dollar apartment where he and her Slovenia. face and her face when Shiv says, oh, but, you know, you never know. He might be sticking around. Oh, like <laughs> God. And, 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 it's like, and I felt, so, and, and in a weird way, in, in this show, when everybody gets what they ultimately deserved or needed to get or where they were headed, the fact that Connor and Willa had what seemed for a fleeting moment the only honest, therefore healthy relationship in the show. And it's over. And it was shattered. It's over I really already. thought they were going to make it. I you did. thought they were really going to make it. They were going to make it. Like, oh, we know who each other is. We understand our relationship, the transaction going on here. And no. I nope, know. Nope, you nope, thought for nope. a second this formally inventive partnership, which is, is hey, you know, it's going to be works, a, new, you know? a new standard for relationships going forward. And it isn't. Um, although still, Connor seems happy because Connor also wants to be Gregging 
in Slovenia. He wants he wants people gregging for him in Slovenia. In Slovenia. He wants they... Slovenian gregs. And like that's kind of what all of these people they want like to be because everybody wants someone to be like, you're awesome and you're my boss. <laughs> that's what what's so wants. strange, what's so strange to me, and, and I'm sure so many other people is again, we come back to this again and again. They never mention it. They're all billionaires. Right. Again. And yeah. and and the one thing I, I've I've met a few, and the one thing these guys can get and women whenever they want is people to suck up to them. Yeah. yeah. That's like <laughs> that's like it, it comes with being a billionaire. It's like you hire staff, they'll all right. suck up to you. Well, you the, can, but you, you know have, the difference, Peter, right? It's like yeah. paying people to suck up to you or actually having them having the authority where they the want authority. to suck up to you. And right. yeah, it's true. And and again And that's the difference. The, the, uh, you're right. And and that is yet another true thing about human beings that this show understands is that the billions don't help if you have that emptiness inside. Um, folks, honestly, again, as with most recap episodes of Succession, we could talk about this forever. Sadly, we have to wrap this shit up. And what I would love for the people of Fake the Nation to do is follow these wonderful, wonderful panelists and everything that they do. Benari, where do they find you? Uh, just find me on the socials at Benari Lee uh, on the Instagram and Twitter and wherever else is being made and destroyed. So no, no Blue Sky <laughs> account yet, Benari? Not, not yet. Not yet. We'll see. Uh, you know, um, I, I've only so much bandwidth. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, so does Blue Sky. You can't get on it. Apparently, um, yeah. Uh, Peter Sagal, where do people find you? Uh, you can find me most weekends on your Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me podcast feed or on your public radio, of course. And you can find me for the moment still on Twitter at Peter Sagal. And yes, I am in fact on Blue Sky because you know what? I just <laughs> need my own cocoon ultimately to feel warm and comfortable. Um, I, Folks, you know where to find me. And um, you, know, you also know that we will be doing some additional recaps um and we will be announcing the show uh the next show that we're going to be doing later so uh stay tuned fake the nation is going to be back on thursday as you know and maybe we'll announce on thursday a uh, reason to tune in uh, um if you want to support the show go to patreon.com slash the game side thanks to everyone who's been doing that it's so delightful of you um, and you know the real hero, the man who wears the crown at Fake the Nation, is the wonderful Andrew McGuire, our producer. He is working today on Memorial Day, and I just want to just, he is the best. Um, uh, <laughs> he's not a pain sponge, he has actual authority, um, and he's, he's more Matson than, than Wom Scans. And um, I would like to thank everyone at HeadGum who makes this show a possibility. I want to thank Bobby Alter for writing our wonderful theme music. Uh, and again, if you have any thoughts about this show or Fake the Nation, please email us at fakethenationpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, we will be back in your earballs on Thursday. That would be SpaceX. <laughs> <laughs>